So, uh, it's my job to introduce Jeremy. Uh, he doesn't need an introduction for many of us, but uh, I've been given the job and I'm going to do it. So, Jeremy Surrey is the Matt Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership and Global Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also a professor of history in the history department and a professor in the LBGJ School of Public Affairs. He received his PhD from Yale University in 2001, where his dissertation was awarded both the John Edison Porter Prize for the best dissertation in the humanities and the Hans Gatsky Prize for the best dissertation in international history. That dissertation then turned into a marvelous book called Power and Protest, Global Revolutions and the Rise of Dayton, which was awarded the Phi Alpha Theta Prize for first, best first books. And I, I think it's fair to say, uh, on a personal note, that that award was well deserved because I read the book in graduate school and it changed the way I think about foreign policy and domestic affairs. And it's really an extraordinary argument, if you don't know it, that this then young man, as a graduate student, uh, found sources from the United States, France, Great Britain, Russia, Hungary, Germany, and showed that on both sides of the Cold War Iron Curtain, the thing binding both friend and foe together was an interest in counter-revolution. And the revolutions they were interested in were not ones occurring in the sphere of foreign policy, which is to say communist or capitalist revolutions, but rather domestic revolutions, started mostly by university students. So this book really changed the way we think about the period known as detente in the Cold War. It was an extraordinary book, and I'd like to thank you personally for it, Jeremy. Uh, so it's not a surprise, I imagine, that after a book like that, uh, Jeremy took a job at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he taught until 2011, until he was allured away from the revolutionary north to come to the slightly less radical but still occasionally revolutionary University of Texas at Austin. Professor Surrey is also the author and editor of nine other books on contemporary politics and foreign policy, including Liberty's Surest Guardian, American Nation Building from the Founders to Obama, and Foreign Policy Breakthroughs, Cases in Successful Diplomacy, which was co-authored with Robert Hutchins. He writes for major news newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, the Dallas Morning News, the Houston Chronicle, Foreign Affairs, The Atlantic, and numerous others. And this evening, he's going to speak to us about his latest work, Unless he's written another one in September? No? Okay, no. This is still the latest book, uh, The Impossible Presidency, The Rise and Fall of America's Highest Office. Will you please join me in welcoming Jeremy Sir? Well, I am uh, really, really, really happy to have uh, my friend Aaron O'Connell uh, introduce me. Uh, Aaron is one of our newest and best hires uh, at the University of Texas. He just joined us. Uh, this is your first semester here, right? Correct. It already feels like you've been here forever. Yes, for me too. Um, <laughs> Aaron uh, does some of the most exciting work on uh, military history, social history, and really America's changing place in the world and the role of the American military as it's changed over time in America's evolution as a society. So we're really lucky to have him here. He's also a dynamic and super teacher. So for the students in the audience, if you haven't taken one of his courses yet, you need to take one of Aaron O'Connell's courses. Uh, my book uh, that I'm talking about today uh, grows out of about five or six years of serious engagement with trying to understand uh, one of, I think, the biggest paradoxes of our world today. And it's something I think we've all confronted in one way or another which is that the United States is so big, so powerful, so wealthy, but yet, it seems more often than not, we're not able to achieve our aims. The history of the last 40 years will not be written as the history of American greatness and American success around the world. It will not be written that way. It won't necessarily be written as the history of failure, but it will not be written as the history of American greatness and achievement in all areas that matter to Americans. Instead, I think the last 40 years will be described as a period of disillusionment, as a period of uh, expectations that were not met, as a period perhaps of overreach. Uh, and there'll be various interpretations within that space. But what motivated me to work on this project was to try to understand why American power and why American wealth, at least in recent decades, has not managed to produce what it promised it would produce. And to do that, uh, I became very interested in the American presidency. And I want to make a, a point really clear here. There are wonderful works on many, many different American presidents. Uh, some of the speakers who are coming through in this series have done tremendous work, Jeff Engel, many others, on particular presidents. And we as historians uh, do a very good job, not just of writing about presidents, sometimes fetishizing presidents. Uh, but what we don't often do 
is study the presidency. There's a difference between the presidents and the presidency. Or to put it in other terms, the drivers of the car matter, but the machinery of the car matters enormously as well. And here's the insight that historians, I think, offer above all else to policymakers and citizens who are interested in the world and interested in policy, but not necessarily interested in history. The insight from history is a very simple one. It's what some would call path dependence, that our institutions, the elements of society that we live in, are often shaped by decisions that are made over time, decisions that in their own moment make a lot of sense, but over time take us on a path that departs far from what our aims and values are. And if you think about your own lives, if you think about your own family, think about it that way. All the things you've done on a day-to-day -day basis that made sense, that were rational on a day-to-day -day basis, but the accumulation of those rational decisions took you in a direction that was very different from where you thought you were going. Or to come back to the car metaphor, you're taking various turns on the car that makes sense for the traffic you're dealing with on 35. But very quickly you find that you've gone far from your intended exit as a consequence of those short-term decisions that made a lot of sense. That's the story of the American presidency, and that's the story of American society. Over time, we have made repeated decisions that more often than not made a lot of good sense for our society. And our leaders have generally been good leaders. But the decisions that we have made in particular moments that serve the interests of those particular moments have over time taken us very far from what we thought our country was about, from what we thought we hoped to achieve, and from quite frankly what our interests as a society are. And my study of the presidency is an effort to understand that. This is not just a story of the presidency. A similar story could be told in the American military, and that's what Aaron O'Connell writes about. A story could be told in the National Security Agency, that's what my friend Will Imboden writes about. There are many other institutions where one could study this. One could even study this in the context of universities and ask how our accumulated decisions over time in universities have taken us perhaps in a different direction. Most founders of universities did not think that they would soon be running large entertainment companies. That's, of course, what they do, right? That's what college athletics is, right? And where do college presidents spend most of their time? Ask yourself, right? These are not because people are making bad decisions. It's because of the accumulated set of obligations that have arisen from a series of decisions over time. That's what we study as historians. That's the insight of history. If you remember nothing else tonight, and my students have had this hammered into their head far too often, so they're trying to forget it. But if you remember nothing else tonight, it's that history teaches us that our institutions reflect day-to-day -day rationality, but they are not rational in the long term. There is an irrationality that comes from the day-to-day -day rational choices. Okay, that's my story of the presidency, and the presidency, as that story that I'm going to tell to you now, shows us how this has happened in our lives before our eyes. Now we have to go back to the beginning, right? We like as historians to go back to the beginning, to the origins. And so we need to begin by remembering, understanding, and studying how the presidency was created itself. And this is one of the biggest myths in American society, that there was this great synthesis, this great consensus in 1789 over what the president should do. In fact, uh, the founding fathers had no idea what the presidency was going to be. It was the most innovative, imaginative, and least understood part of the Constitutional Convention. It was the greatest leap of faith that the founders made. They believed that the United States needed a figure like a king who would bring the country together. They understood acutely that citizens of Massachusetts did not call themselves Americans, nor did citizens of Georgia. And in fact, they could barely understand each other. And don't get me started on what people living in Tejas called themselves, <laughs> right? They understood there was no common Americanness and they looked to a sovereign, they looked to a king as a figure who would bring people together. But as you know, they were profoundly anti-monarchical. They had seen the problems of degeneracy. Thomas Paine put this very well. In common sense, he said, the son of a noble is as likely to be a moron as the son of a baker is to be a genius. And he was right, of course, right? My best students are the children of bakers, probably, right? Especially when they bring me pastries that I like. <laughs> at least someone laughed at that. <laughs> they recognized that you needed a figure that stood above a party as a king did, but couldn't be a hereditary ruler. 
So they looked to create an alternative democratic pathway to monarchical power. That explains, for example, why this elected figure has the power to pardon, which is a traditional power given to a monarch or perhaps a religious minister. It explains that among many other things. They were looking, in James Madison's words, for a democratic, patriotic king. And everyone hears the contradictions in that. And they never understood, actually, how that would work. As best as they could, they estimated that the House of Representatives would choose American presidents. Why did they think that? Well, because the Constitution says that you cannot be elected president without a majority of the electors. They did not use the term electoral college. Majority of the electors. They believed, the founders did, that no individual would be able to get a majority of the electors. That what would happen would be every state would nominate its favorite son. The biggest states would have the most electors. You'd have four candidates, probably from the four largest states. And it would go to the House of Representatives, which it did, actually, in 1800 and 1824. They believed that this would actually be the norm, how wrong they were. How wrong they were. Article 2 of the Constitution does not tell us very much about how the president operates. And the first point I want to make today, it's a basic historical point about the presidency. The presidency has evolved in the doing. It has evolved over time. It has evolved as the institution has been remade by people in it and people outside of it. It has not been defined by the Constitution. And anyone, after today's lecture, whoever tells you that they are going back to the original intent of the Constitution, they are lying to you. Because there is no original intent there. There is no original intent there on this issue. The presidency was created, as we know it, by George Washington, not by the Constitution. Washington was the only thing they could agree on, that this man should be president, not what he should do. And the real Hamilton-Jefferson debates which are a bit broader than the show, but the show does a decent job with them. Uh, the real debates are over what presidential power should be. What should the president do? Jefferson has a much more constrained vision than Alexander Hamilton has. Jefferson's vision, not surprisingly, broadens when he's president himself, of course. But he has a constrained vision at that time. Washington, as president, does one thing and one thing alone. He seeks to unite the country. He sees himself not as a policy maker. He explicitly says he is not. He does not see himself as an expert. He doesn't even see himself as a military expert. He sees himself as a unifying figure, as a father figure for this new nation in its birth. And he spends most of his presidency actually doing that, traveling around the country and building what he calls the infrastructure of a common nation for these United States. And that's how people refer to them. These United States. He spends his time traveling, meeting with people, selling the idea of the United States. And if you read his farewell address, it's all about that in 1796. And he invests his prestige in the support of institutions and plans that will bring the country together. And that is why he supports Hamilton's economic plan. That is why he supports it. The federal government will take over the debts of the states so that there will be a common capital market. And a common capital market will sew the country together. Why did he know this was important? Well, as I show in the book, one of the biggest problems he had as a commander of revolutionary forces was getting money out of the Continental Congress. And he couldn't borrow money because there was not a single capital market in the United States. So by creating a single capital market, you allow Americans to float debt. And in floating debt, you build the infrastructure of a common country. That's what he believed he was doing. He also, by the way, proposed a national university of the United States, which was never built. Of course, uh, the University of Texas has taken on that role. Right? <laughs> but the very fact that he's thinking in those terms tells us a lot about his presidency. And as I show in the book, this is the model of the presidency early on, as a father figure, not a policy expert, but as a unifier. Washington did not belong to a party. And in his farewell address, he calls upon all future presidents to avoid belonging to a party. You see how much they've listened to him uh, ever since. Uh, I argue in the book that even Andrew Jackson can be thought of in exactly this framework. Jackson sees himself as the father figure for those on the frontier who have been left behind. He is the first populist and an authentic populist because Jackson's view is that Massachusetts and Virginia that have held the presidency, the first eight presidents, he believes that they have dominated political power and that Philadelphia and New York have dominated banking power and those on the frontier have been left out. So he seeks, in his terms, revering Washington to bring this father figure to the frontier. And he even calls himself the father of the Indians. And his father, he's telling him to get off the land. 
So this is a genocidal, actually, policy toward Indians that's key to what he sees as his fatherly role toward the white settlers on the frontier. And Jackson, above all, is about union. This is very important. He's a defender of slavery, but he banks no, no willingness to accept anything that runs against the union as such. That's his big fight with John C. Calhoun, in fact. So Jackson is carrying on Washington's presidency. This is the first phase of the presidency, the first 50 years of our country. The president is a unifying figure. And much of the survival of our country is because this figure brings us together. If you look at the literature and the rhetoric of Americanness, it's actually centered not on the policy of the presidency, but the figure that brings us together. The real second phase of the presidency, the transformation of the office that occurs in the mid-19th century, happens with one of my heroes, Abraham Lincoln. You've all heard of if you haven't, you can leave now. It's okay. <laughs> uh, and I do want to say this to everyone in the room. Uh, all of us have encountered Lincoln. I've spent a lot of time reading Lincoln. You need to keep reading Lincoln. It always pays off. Good literature is always worth reading. And Lincoln's writing is up there with Mark Twain and Nathaniel Hawthorne. He is one of the great stylists in American history, not just one of the great political stylists. And he proves that good style matters in politics. And it is profoundly humbling, because he had only two years of education. We've all been educated far more than Abraham Lincoln, and we do far less with our words. Abraham Lincoln takes the United States into its second phase, and he puts the president at the front of it. And his presidency would be unrecognizable to George Washington. Lincoln not only uses the presidency to fight the Civil War and keep the Union together, he sets out to redefine the meaning of the American economy through the presidency. And this is intimately connected to the way that he views slavery. Why does Lincoln hate slavery? Not simply for moral reasons. As a poor white man on the frontier, slavery is the worst possible thing. Because what do slaves do? They bring down wages of the propertyless poor white men on the frontier like himself. I always say this, if you want to get someone to do the right thing, make sure it matches up with their economic interests. Never ask someone to do the right thing that runs directly against their economic interests because they're not going to do it and they'll lie to you about it afterwards, right? I've learned this teaching for many, many years. <laughs> Lincoln, Lincoln transforms the president from father figure to nation builder and CEO. And there are a lot of interesting parts of Lincoln's background that are forgotten in this context. His job before being president, who knows? What was his job? Lawyer. 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 What kind of lawyer? Civil rights. Corporate lawyer. The first corporate lawyer president. Lincoln represented the railroads in Illinois, which were the largest corporations of the time. Illinois had more railroad headquarters than any other state. He tried more cases on behalf of the railroads in appellate court in Illinois than any other lawyer of his generation. That's actually where he learned to make his case. Lincoln saw the federal government as a role, having a role in creating a modern industrial capitalist society with the three things the Republican Party believed. And he's the first Republican president. He's there in the foundation of the Republican Party. Free labor. All men should be able to work and get paid for their work. Get paid for their work. All men, regardless of color. Free soil. Everyone should be able to own the land. I'll come back to that point. Regardless of color. And free men, meaning all participate. Free labor, free soil, free men. That's the Republican vision of the time. That's a transformation in the role of the president. Lincoln does three things as president, oversees three major transformations that put him at the head of a developmental vision that's far beyond the imagining of the founders. First, the Homestead Act of 1862. Pushed by Lincoln, it's a Republican piece of legislation. It's implemented by Lincoln. What does the Homestead Act do? It gives all families that work the land the ability to own the land for free. And this is really important. Under the Homestead Act, you do not have to be a citizen. So there are tens of thousands, by some estimates hundreds of thousands, but the estimates differ among historians, of Irish, Italian, German, and yes, Mexican immigrants who become landowners. This is the Republican vision, populating the frontier with people who will work for a wage and produce things from the land. Second major part of Lincoln's program, the Moral Land Grants of 1862. The legislation fails in 1859. Lincoln pushes it in 1862, signs it in the midst of the lowest point of the Civil War. What does the Moral Land Grant do? It gives federal land to the states 
that the states will convert into cash by selling the land. Cornell University receives the land grant. MIT receives the land grant. University of Wisconsin, University of California, Berkeley, this place in College Station, I can never remember its name. <laughs> they get a land grant too. The money is used to create a university. What does the legislation say? That the university should be open to all men, and soon women, all men, and it should be trained in the advanced science and mechanical arts and the liberal arts. And as I remind my engineering colleagues all the time, the term liberal arts is in the legislation. It's there. There is an original intent there. Lincoln believed his role as president was to help other poor white men have access to education, to become better farmers, and to read Shakespeare. How did he learn to write? By reading Shakespeare and reading the Bible. Lincoln, as president, is making that happen, using the power of the federal government, using the power of the presidency. Third thing he does, he creates the first major subsidy program. And it's a program that historians like Richard White have disentangled and pointed out actually created a lot of corruption. But it's a major subsidy program for whom? The railroads. The railroads. To create more railroad development. From 1860 to 1890, the United States builds more railroad stock than any other country in the world. That's amazing if you think about how we don't use railroads today. Uh, and the Transcontinental Railroad, completed in 1869, after Lincoln's presidency, really signals Lincoln's major achievement. Everyone knows what it is, right? Chicago Pizza. <laughs> Chicago pizza, right? Why does the pizza in Chicago get so high? It's because of Abraham Lincoln, right? The railroads bring in more wheat, more dairy, and more pigs to Chicago than to any other city in the world. And the Jewish butchers in Chicago slay the pigs, dry it out, and put the pepperoni on the pizza. And that's how we get my pepperoni pizza. That's exactly where it comes from, in fact. So I, next time you eat that, think of Lincoln. It's a fundamental transformation of what the presidency does. The presidency has gone from being a father figure to being a CEO, an economic development agency for the country. And that's exactly how Republicans talk about it at the time. Theodore Roosevelt carries this vision forward. Uh, but Theodore Roosevelt does, and I love writing about Theodore Roosevelt, talking about it. I'm not going to say too much now. We don't have that much time. But what has to be said about Theodore Roosevelt is he takes this vision of economic development and adds to it a deep belief in knowledge and expertise. Theodore Roosevelt is all about bringing the best knowledge together with the best economic power and using the presidency to make the economy work even better and to take it global, which is why he supports the Panama Canal, why he supports imperial adventures overseas. Uh, he it buys into a lot of the racism of his time, but he also believes, whether naively or not, in the liberatory possibilities of economic development and the president's taking a fundamental leading role in that. So he's a continuation of Lincoln's presidency. The third phase of the presidency, the third phase of the rise of presidential power, the changing of the office, and notice how far we've gone from the Constitution, is the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, who is in many ways my hero, but also the tragic figure in the book. He gets to be in the middle. In all of my books, the middle figure is the, is the tragic person. So I only have two kids, not three, because we have the middle. <laughs> what does Franklin Roosevelt do? He and coming from the most elite of backgrounds, right? If George H.W. Bush was born, as Ann Richard said, with a silver foot in his mouth, um, FDR was born with the whole China set in his mouth, right? I mean, this man was the elite of the elites. But he recognized from his own suffering uh, as a polio victim, he recognized how much of one's life is not controlled, how much is beyond our control. And he recognized something else, which I think is one of the most important historical insights we all need to carry with us, which is that capitalism produces enormous wealth. I'm a capitalist. But it also produces losers. There is no capitalist society that has ever existed that I've studied where there weren't large numbers of people who suffered while others did very well. And those who have suffered are often suffering for reasons that have no cause in their own behavior. Which is to say, all of us with a couple of turns in our lives, a couple of misfortunes, could be somewhere else rather than here. Roosevelt, I think, we never know for certain. Roosevelt, because of his own suffering through polio, recognized that. If he hadn't gone to that one school and been exposed at that one moment, he wouldn't have had polio. And all the people he had to spend time with in Warm Springs, all the polio sufferers, it changed his view. As President Roosevelt wanted to be a father figure, he pushed for economic development, that was his solution to the New Deal, but he also made the presidency into a healer for the country. 
And this is why being a historian is so much fun. Because I've read, as many others in this room have, thousands of oral histories from this period. Here's the interesting thing about Roosevelt. Those who loved him and those who hated him, he was ubiquitous. He brought the presidency into their homes through using the radio, but also through empathy. And, and boy, oh boy, it's a lesson we've forgotten. Leadership is not about telling people what to do. Leadership is about connecting with people, empathizing with them, and then encouraging them to help themselves. That's what Roosevelt did. Those of you who have been unfortunate enough to be in my classes, I make you listen to some of Roosevelt's fireside chats. This is what you hear him doing. He explains people's pain. He validates. He legitimizes it. There are no winners and losers in Roosevelt's world. There are no little rocket men, right? He speaks to people directly, makes them feel he cares, and empowers them to work with others to help themselves. The two examples I use in the book, one is from Saul Bellow, one of my favorite novelists. Saul Bellow was a Russian Jewish immigrant to the United States who grew up in Chicago. Growing up in Chicago, Bellow thought all politicians were crooks, and that has not changed, of course, in Chicago. My wife's in Chicago, but uh, your root, the general rule is mayor, Chicago, governor, Illinois, jail. <laughs> that process, right? Four of the last six governors, I think, actually, right? Uh, what Bellow says is that he heard this man on the radio with this funny voice, and he didn't always understand what he said. This man spoke to him. Roosevelt was the first politician who spoke to him. Another man who said that was Ronald Reagan, right of Hillary Clinton. Ronald Reagan's second to last speech as president, he goes to the FDR library and talks about how Franklin Roosevelt was his hero and how Franklin Roosevelt, quote, saved my family. He learned to communicate from Roosevelt, more than that. When his father, Jack Reagan, lost his job as a shoe salesman, it was a Roosevelt agency that gave his father hope, that gave his father a job. His father actually, by 1935, was working for the Works Progress Administration as what we would later come and call a community organization. Jack Reagan actually was given money by a Roosevelt agency to organize people in Dixon, Illinois for public works projects. That's a community organizer, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't that ironic that Reagan's father and Barack Obama had in some ways the same, the same job? The argument is that Roosevelt made people feel that their pain was not theirs alone and that they could work with others. His economic policies did not always work. His military strategy had many problems for a long time. But in bringing people together in being a healer and empathizer, he brought the president into people's lives and he did it with an authenticity and authenticity that had not been seen before. So you have three phases of the presidency there. The institution changing to serve different needs and leaders making those changes happen. To go from father figure to nation builder to empathizer and healer. But that's also the beginning of the end. Roosevelt's a tragic figure. Because Roosevelt takes on these responsibilities, as so many of us take on responsibilities, at a moment when the demands begin to skyrocket. By the end of World War II, I don't think we've fully come to grips with this, by the end of World War II, when Roosevelt dies, he is not only expected to do this for the United States, he's expected to do this for much of the world. In fact, he has made that claim. Read the Atlantic Charter, the United Nations Charter. The United States is taking on this healing role for the world. And he can barely keep up with the demands at home. And what we see from Roosevelt's time forward that I described, looking at John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Ronald Reagan, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, and yes, Donald Trump, is that the responsibilities of the office, the demands of the office, like the demands on many of our lives, make it impossible for the presidents to actually do the things they care most about. They spend more time in perpetual crisis mode, serving more purposes in more places and doing, in fact, nothing poorly, but nothing well either. John F. Kennedy is a great example of this, and I reprinted in the book. It's so much fun to work with this material. I reprinted Roosevelt's calendar, the actual image of his calendar, his daily calendar from the day after the Pearl Harbor attack, and John F. Kennedy's 20 years later when he's briefed on the missiles in Cuba. And they are different worlds, ladies and gentlemen. If nothing else, just look at those in the book. They are different worlds. Roosevelt's life has few meanings. Roosevelt has lots of time to think. Roosevelt brings people together. 
Roosevelt has time to focus on a few issues. He's got lots of responsibility, but they're chunked into few issues, and he has time to lead. John F. Kennedy barely has time to get into the meetings where he's going to decide whether to blow up the world. And when he comes into those meetings, those who have been there before him have already set the agenda. He finds himself working to protect his own power against staff members and others who are making fait accompli decisions for him. This is his problem with the military, that they're actually already going down a path before he's even come into the meeting. He's running in from something else. He's not prepared to deal with that. He finds himself in a reactive mode. He says, by the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we cannot do this again. We cannot do this again because it's so dangerous, but also because we don't have the energy even though the government and the staff has grown so large. Lyndon Johnson falls into this as well. You all know this story. No one cared more about dealing with problems of poverty and civil rights in the United States post-World War II than Lyndon Johnson. And to this day, he's still done more for American civil rights post-World post War II than any other president. But yet Johnson finds himself, during his time in office, spending more and more time on the things he cares least about, the biggest one being Vietnam. From 1964 on, he makes it quite clear that there's no interest in Vietnam, does not want to be in Vietnam, but he's afraid to get out. Doesn't feel he can get out. Presidents are not supposed to withdraw from communist conflicts. They're supposed to win them. So you have to stay in. And he finds more and more of his time going into those kinds of commitments, not the things he cares most about. And his commitments and the things he cares least about will delegitimize his commitments and the things he cares most about. This will continue, even with Ronald Reagan, who recognizes this problem, who sees that the presidency is doing too much. Reagan will try to step back, but as I show in the chapter, he will continually find himself being pulled into more and more things. Iran-Contra is the best example of that. There are a lot of good things Reagan does, by the way. He's not a failure, but there are also a lot of bad things that happen. Iran-Contra is the best example, and he probably should have been impeached for this. Uh, what happens with Iran-Contra? Well, Reagan is firm. We don't negotiate with terrorists. You really believe that? Reagan is also firm. We follow the law. He tells his administration time and again, when Congress passes the Bolin Amendment that says we don't need the Contras, Reagan intends to follow the law. He really does. But at the same time, Americans are being kidnapped in Beirut and elsewhere, and Reagan feels enormous pressure to get these Americans released. So he's told his staff, don't negotiate with terrorists. But he's also told them, do what you need to do to get these terrorists released. The government's doing two separate things at the same time. Two separate things. Not dishonestly, two parts of the government are doing two different things. Same thing with the Contras. Reagan tells his staff, don't break the law, but aid the anti-communist forces, who are the Contras. And so one part of the government is following the law, another part of the government is aiding the Contras. The size of the government and the range of responsibilities and demands and stakeholders leads us to do contradictory things. Here's why Reagan should have been impeached. When he finds out about it, which he does, he covers it up. He lies. And why do we have more cover-ups over time? Not because we have worse leaders, but there's more to cover up. There's more to cover up. We're doing more things we shouldn't be doing, and so we're covering them up day and day and day after day. That's the problem with the presidency as we see it. That's why Donald Trump was elected, I argue. That's the epilogue of the book that I had to rewrite after November 6th, 2016. That's why Donald Trump was elected. Americans are not dumb. I think American voters are actually very smart. And American, not all American voters, most of them. <laughs> American voters are smart. And they recognize that the presidency was not fulfilling its promises and purposes regardless of who was in office, from George W. Bush to Barack Obama. And there are many people who voted for George W. Bush, then Barack Obama, and then Donald Trump in parts of northern Wisconsin and Michigan and elsewhere. And they're not dumb people. And by the way, they're actually not racist people. <clears throat> right? I know many of those communities. They voted for Donald Trump because they were fed up with what they believed was a presidency that wasn't fulfilling its purpose. And their belief was you had to blow it up to change it. The problem is that that's destined to fail, even if Donald Trump were trying to do what he promised to do. Because the problems are not about the driver of the car. They're about the machinery. You can't say you want the office to operate better, but do all the things it's always been doing. You can't say you want less government, but take your hands off 
my Medicare and Social Security check. You can't say you want lower tuition, but then cut all funding for universities. You can't say you want everyone to have health care, but then not in any way create a basis for costing and rationing health care. You can't do those things. They're inherently contradictory. And the presidency has been trying to do all of them, failing, and simply putting someone else in the driver's seat is not going to change that. And isn't that why we're stuck where we were with health care before? Isn't that why we're stuck in all the same places and instead the president now has to create issues like players kneeling in the national anthem to distract us from the fact he can't do anything? That the problems are structural in our society. You see, we don't have too much government or too little government. That is a wasted debate. We have unfocused government. There are areas where we need more government, and we can disagree on what they are. But I would think in the environment, I would think in healthcare, there are a number of areas where we need more government. And there are a lot of areas where we need less government. Bathrooms, less government, please. Right? Areas where we need more government, and areas where we need less government. More or less, depending on the issue. We need a focused discussion of what sociologists call the functional purposes of our institutions. And my book is about how we lost our way because our institutions functionally served their purposes for 150 years, but after that point, the path they were on took them in a direction of accreting more responsibility, but actually performing less of the functions that the people of the United States need. Americans want more economic opportunity, they want better health care, they want a better environment, they want better education for their kids, right? Everyone says that. And they're frustrated that our government is not doing it, and it's not failing to do that because bad people are in office, though that could be a problem too. It's failing to do that because the structure of our government no longer serves those purposes. So my book is a history of how we came to this point, and as my wife would tell you, I'm much better with the problems than the solutions. But I, I will, I close the book, and I will close briefly now, briefly intentionally, on a few pathways to think forward about this, right? First point, uh, if what I'm saying is right, and I, I think it is, I'm pretty sure it is, uh, if it's right, we need to actually have a discussion about our institutions. We have to stop fetishizing our constitution. I'm a deep believer in the wisdom of our founders. And the wisdom of our founders is that their words were not going to determine the next 250 years. They were wise, humble people, much humbler than the people who claim to speak for them now on both sides of the aisle. We need to have a discussion about how our institutions should be reformed. And all of us in this room need to lead that discussion. We spend far too much time quetching over who's in office, not talking about how the offices can be changed. We need a burst of what Theodore Roosevelt called institutional dynamism. He changed the way the civil service operated. It used to be 25% of civil servants in the US were illiterate. They were just appointed as political uh, friends. He created the first civil service exams, changed the way the civil service operated. We need to have that discussion. We need to teach institutions. We need to talk about this. And most important, we need to choose political leaders who will talk about this, who have experience. My book, I think, shows above all else, you cannot improve our society if you come into office and have never actually been in public service before. It is a totally different entity. You don't have to have spent your whole life in public service. But I don't want a doctor who's never operated before operating on me. I don't want a pilot flying the plane who's never fly the plane before, right? I don't want a president or a member of Congress who's never bothered to be involved in public service. Because they won't understand how these institutions operate. They won't understand how the sausage is made they can't perform. So we need people who actually have inside knowledge and we have to start valuing that. This fetishism of outsiders is totally ridiculous, actually. Ridiculous. Second, as if that's not controversial enough. <laughs> Second, we need real knowledge. We need facts. Jefferson says this. Democracy is based upon the presumption that people can study the issues and make rational decisions based on their study of the issues. And Jefferson did not believe that people would all go to university, nor did he believe that they would all become experts on the issues. But he believed that they would have access to faithful information, information they could trust. There's no such thing as objective information, but there's information that's produced with the intention of being true, and there's information which is not produced with the intention of being true. And we've always had uh, false news, fake news in our society. The William Randolph Hearst papers, the yellow journalism of the late 19th century, this is not new. There's more of it today because of technology, but also, ladies and gentlemen, what we haven't talked about is that we have singularly underfunded the sources of news key to the truth. 
From the early 20th century on, Americans invest more than any other society in creating institutions like the legislative review bureaus of many states, judicial expertise, organizations later called things like the Government Accounting Office and others, and universities, and universities. And let me make this as clear as I can. I have spent the last, well, longer than I want to admit in universities. I've spent my whole life in universities, right? There's a lot of uh, difference of point of view, and there tends to be a left-leaning bias among uh, faculty and most students in universities. But the vast majority, with very, very few exceptions, of scholars I have worked with in my career at five universities are doing what they do to pursue the truth, not to propagandize. Universities are not Fox News, nor are they CNBC. They are institutions with people who devote their lives to the pursuit of truth. That doesn't mean they always get it right. But that information is much more reliable and valuable than information that's produced based on revenue. I'm not against revenue producing institutions producing news and knowledge. They have a right to do that. I believe in almost an absolutist on free speech. And I believe anyone should have the right to come up here and speak. But we need to fund the pursuit of real, truthful information. We have underfunded that. And by the way, it costs next to nothing. You don't like NPR? Let's have another one. That's like one aircraft. Right? Uh, they're talking about defunding the NEA. That's one tenth of one percent of discretionary spending. It's ridiculous. Right? Funding knowledge is the cheapest and most valuable thing to do one of the ways to get through the problems we're in today. Okay, third and final solution that I offer, the one that will never happen, but that should happen, you heard it here first, or you read it first, whatever, is that the presidency is too much for one person. It's become too much. The founders believed it was doable for one person, but it was small. It's become too much. It's become too much. And I'm embarrassed, I didn't know this until I was deep into the book and actually opened my eyes, and I'm supposed to be a comparative political scientist historian, right? I looked around and realized, my gosh, we're the only major democracy now that invests all this power in one person. Germany, France, India, they split the executive in different ways. The Bundes president in Germany does things different from the French president, and the French prime minister has different powers from the Bundes consular. The Indian president and the Indian prime minister have different kinds of powers. Every society splits it differently, but we're the only one that still does it with one. So we're the biggest. And yet we think one person should do it all in the executive role. It makes no sense. Presidents are overwhelmed. They come into office and they're overwhelmed by the amount of information before them. And they basically, as I think I showed pretty clearly, spend most of their time just kicking the can down the road because they can't get their arms around the issues. We would be well served to actually think about splitting the office. Every business I know, every major corporation has a CEO. Some have a president as well. They have a board. They have a CFO. They have a COO. Universities have presidents and provosts and thousands of other administrators who do things I don't understand. Why don't we think about the presidency in those terms? Why is it just one person? And here's the thought experiment I'll leave you with. Imagine tomorrow you woke up and all of a sudden, you know, the world of the sun shined on us here. And Paul Ryan, or Nancy Pelosi, Robert happens to be a Speaker of the House, was not chosen by the six most extreme members of their party. Because that's what happens, right? If Ryan or Pelosi loses the six most or seven most extreme members of their party, they don't have enough votes to be Speaker of the House, and they're gone, right? So who's making policy in Congress? The six most extreme members of the party in power who are from the most gerrymandered districts. So they represent no one, and they're holding our policy hostage, right? And that would happen with the Democrats as much as with the Republicans. This is not a partisan issue. This is bipartisan corruption, right? But imagine instead if the Speaker of the House was elected by the American people. Or even, and I've never said this before in my life, imagine if they followed the Texas model and the Speaker of the House, like our Speaker of the Assembly, were chosen by both parties. How differently Joe Strauss operates in the Assembly from Paul Ryan or Nancy Pelosi. Things would look very different tomorrow if the Speaker of the House was accountable to the people rather than the extremes of his or her party. Here's the interesting thing. There's not a word in the Constitution about the Speaker of the House is chosen. Over time, we've done it this way for partisan reasons. We don't have to keep doing it this way. We need to think deeply, deeply, about how our great institutions have decayed over time 
and how we can be part of a renewal of these institutions. And I'm optimistic, these will be my last words, I promise, I'm optimistic because I have the best job in the world. I get to teach three to 400 undergraduates uh, most semesters. And uh, the millennials are great. I'm not just saying this because you're here. Uh, they're great because they're problem solvers. They believe in changing institutions. You guys don't revere institutions. You want to solve problems. And if your parents will just get off your backs and stop telling you to go and major in one thing to get a job, but instead encourage you to change the world, you have the opportunity to change the world. So when you leave here today, think about reforming institutions, think of getting involved in that, and stop telling people to go to college and simply make money. Encourage them to go to college to change the world. That's why we're here. Thank you.